Hello there everyone, and welcome to another tier list video, because I assume everyone loved the last one. I mean, I think people liked it. It has above average views compared to my other videos. I don't know. Feedback is rare because I don't get too many comments. But I'm just going to assume everyone liked it anyway, so I'm back with more. And I am sick right now, so that's probably why my voice sounds terrible. And since I'm not good at editing, I don't think I can fix it. But hey, we're doing this anyways, because why not? Now, last time I did a tier list for preschool shows, and I was told, you know, that's too young of a demographic. You can't really judge it, you can't really relate to it, and I understand completely. So I'm going older this time, and we are doing teenage sitcoms. Because teenagers are indeed older than preschoolers. So let's see how this goes. 65 different teenage sitcoms featuring Disney, Nick, and others. Okay, starting off, we start off not too well, because I have never seen Sunny with a Chance. I didn't hear too many good things about it when it was airing, so I don't think I missed out on much. Next up is Ned's Declassified School Survival Guide, and that is easily S tier. This show is, uh, it's classic, it's iconic, it's memorable, it's nostalgic. I really love this show. Uh, when it was airing, I was in elementary school, and watching it, I was really looking forward to middle school. I thought middle school was gonna be a lot of fun, I thought I was gonna love it, and then middle school kinda just happened. Like, if I'm being honest, I don't remember too much of middle school. It was just there it just happened i don't have memories of it like elementary school i really have fond memories of elementary school because that was my childhood i have nostalgia for it and then high school high school was my formative years i met some great friends i had some really good teachers i i just grew a lot and i mean i had a lot of growth in college too but i think high school was really how i started forming my identity how i became the person i am middle school just just happened it was just there but as for the show itself like I said, it holds up a lot, it's really good, and what I really like is that the lessons in the show are actually pretty helpful and applicable. Like, I mean, obviously the uh, the situations and circumstances are exaggerated for the purposes of the show and for entertainment and comedy, but looking at it at a bare level, at just the lessons themselves, they are very helpful and very applicable to actual situations you find yourself in. And I think that's really good, that it can be entertaining and at the same time, helpful and relatable. Next up is I'm in the band and that one is just it's just an okay show. It's funny, it has some good comedy, but there's not too much for me to say about it. I have some pretty okay memories of watching it and enjoying it, but it's nothing too special. Something that always kind of disappointed me was this is a show about a band. Like the band is a huge focal point, a huge focus, but they never really focus on the music. And I mean, I understand that the band is more of a framing device than an actual plot point. I think it would be pretty cool if they had released like some albums or something, or like some downloads or something. I mean, I probably would have never listened to the music myself, but it still would have been cool just to have. Like something just to have the show stand out, to make it more special. As is, it's just okay, it's enjoyable, it's funny, it's, it's B tier. Gamer's Guide to pretty much everything. Uh, the best way I can explain this show is this is what happens when... Disney and um, marketing people realize, hey, people love gaming, people love YouTubers, let's do that. This show is really just capitalizing on the huge interest that gaming videos and Let's Players had on YouTube. Because that, like, it exploded, it was this huge thing, and, well, Disney wanted part of it. That's why they have all the gaming segments that they have on Disney XD. Because that appeals to kids, and they want to appeal to kids, that's their audience. As for the show itself, it's not really that good. It's just, it's kind of funny, but not really. I never really found it to be too humorous. The gaming that they do is gaming in quotes because it's really, it's really fake. And it really doesn't, it doesn't represent true gaming. And I'm gonna use true gaming in quotes because I mean, what even is gaming? Like, how do you describe that? But what they do in the show is Hollywood's idea of gaming. It's like using all the cool gamer slang and oh, hacking and cheat codes and stuff. It's just, it feels really fake. It really feels like they're just trying to market to gaming because gaming is popular. There is one thing that the show does really well and I'll give it points for is um, it has a female main character and they don't treat her as lesser than the male gamers. She's just as good of a gamer as they are, she's just as good as of a player as they are, she's just as valuable to the team, and I really commend them for that. 
It would have been very easy to make a cheap joke. Oh, the girl doesn't know how to game. Like, how do you hold a controller? What is a play box? Like, just cheap jokes at the expense of the female, but they don't do that. She's a competent member of the gaming team. She knows how to game and she enjoys it. And it's really good that they have a female gamer on the team that is equal to the male gamers. I really enjoy that. It really shows that gaming isn't just for guys. So because they managed to do something right, even though the show itself isn't that good, I'll give it C tier. Liv and Maddie. This is a tough one. I didn't like this show when it was first starting, but that's because I was in the, I was in this sort of phase where I was too cool for teen sitcoms. I was like, oh yeah, those teen shows, that's what kids are watching. I'm too cool for that. I'm going to go do some adult stuff. Like I was really, I was really just a bit pretentious, a bit too, I felt too mature for these shows. I thought that they were beneath me, but these shows are still really good. Like they still hold up. I think, um, a lot of people say that modern sitcoms are trash or they're garbage or the older ones were better. And I think that's a lot of nostalgia talking. I think if you actually sit down, watch these newer shows, you'll see that they're just as good. The humor is different, but that's because the target is different. What appealed to people my age or people older than me is different than what appeals to kids now. The humor is different because it's appealing to a different generation and humor changes over time. But even if the jokes themselves don't work for you, there's still a lot to enjoy of these newer shows. They still have good characters, they still have good plots. They're still relatable. Like they're still good shows, they still hold up and they're still fun to watch. And another thing that people complain a lot about newer shows is the laugh track. But if we're being honest, old shows have laugh tracks too. They're used a lot more now, but that's more of a, it's a result of attention spans decreasing. And that's a whole nother topic. But I don't think laugh tracks really take away from the show. They're annoying and I don't like them and they're unnecessary, but I don't think they take away from the show itself. But anyways, getting back to Liv and Maddie, once I dropped my I'm too cool for teen sitcom phase and started watching Disney and Nick shows again, it shows is really good. I really like it. I really love it. The characters are great. Uh, the sibling dynamic between Liv and Maddie is really good, really strong. And I've got to say, overall, this is just a really wonderful show that I enjoy. I think it's A tier. Okay, moving on, we have Lab Rats, and Lab Rats is, um, it's a tricky one. Like, when it started off, it was this really small, contained story just about this kid whose mom ma married this guy, and now the, the, um, they're uh, bionic heroes and stuff. It, it was this small, contained story, really small. But as the show went on, it grew more and more, until the point where there was an entire academy of bionic heroes and, like, an entire island protecting the world and stuff. And it just, it grew really big. It expanded so much. And I like that. I like that the show grew and expanded and it got a lot darker. It had a really strong lore and I think it's really good. But at the same time, I think uh, along the way, it kind of lost itself. I feel like as it grew bigger and bigger and got these more in-depth plots, these more intricate storylines, it kind of lost what made it unique in the first place. It became just another uh, hero show. Like, this one was pretty unique because it had a pretty nice family angle to it. It was really... It was contained. It was self-contained. It was small. But as it grew bigger and bigger, it lost that smallness that made it stand out. And it, it's not bad. It never really became bad. And I, like I said, I love that it, it got so much lore. I love that it became so deep and intricate. And I love that there's so much that you can really just take at it and so much you can enjoy from it. But, I don't know. If they wanted to expand then they shouldn't have started so small. Because it starts from being this nice small thing to this huge thing, and it really contrasts so much. Like the first season and the last season, they contrast so heavily because they're so different in tone, so different in structure, just different in everything that you don't even know they're the same show. And I feel that just kind of, it creates this odd dissonance for me. And so because of that, I'm gonna put it in, I'll put it in uh, B tier. Just because of the fact that, you know, it's just, it's a weird thing going from so small to so big. And then there's another reason it's B tier, but I'll get to that just a bit later. Sweet Life of Zack and Cody, that's nostalgia right there. Iconic, uh, memorable. Zack and Cody are great characters. It, it's just a great show overall. Like, great uh, great supporting characters, a great cast, a great main set. The uh, Tipton Hotel is really cool. I really like it. I'm going to put that one in A tier. Okay, um, next up is Life with Derek. 
This is a tricky one because I didn't really see too much of Life of Derek. I caught a few episodes here and there. I did catch the um, I did catch the the finale, the series finale, and I've got to say it's a really strong finale. Like I love sitcoms that have strong finales because it just really brings everything together. It brings together character development. It brings together plot lines. It brings together just just so much growth and change that you can see reflected in that finale. And Life with Derek had a really good finale. Like I really liked it. As for where I would place it, that's a bit harder. I guess I'll go with B tier just because I don't think I saw enough to justify A tier, but I'm sure if I saw more, it would be an A tier show. Hannah Montana is another uh, classic uh, nostalgia show. I don't think I've ever seen a premise done like this in a while. Like the whole double life thing, yeah, that's been around for a while and it's not really that unique. But the way it was sort of executed where it was like, it's not just a double life, but it's a double life mixed with a music show, mixed with just, you know, uh, friends and family. Like, it just brings all of these different aspects together. And as the show grows and more people start to learn Miley's secret, until the point where she doesn't even have a secret, it just creates a lot of growth and change for the character. And I really like that. I think it's really good. I think uh, Miley has a lot of growth over the course of uh, the series, and she really becomes... She becomes this, an independent character. She grows a lot. And I really like that. Uh, I, I haven't listened to Miley Cyrus's music ever, and I mean ever as an ever, I didn't even listen to Hannah Montana music, but I can't really say it's bad music, it's not my taste, it's not my thing, I won't listen to it, but I'm not gonna call her a bad music artist, I think what she does is really good, really commendable, and you know, she got her start from this show, like yeah, she already had a name because of her dad, but her as an individual, this was sort of where she made her mark, and how she grew from here. And I just think it's really cool that, you know, she went from being just this Disney Channel star to this really big music person. Whether you like her or dislike her, you can't really negate her talent and her popularity. I just think Hannah Montana, uh, Hannah Montana is A tier. A uh, hundred things to do before high school. I'd like to describe this show as Ned's Classified School Survival Guide if Ned's Classified School Survival Guide wasn't as good as Ned's Classified School Survival Guide really is. A hundred things to do before high school is a pretty weak show. It's a good concept of a bucket list of things you want to do before you get to high school. Because the thing is, uh, the main characters, they're worried that when they get to high school, they're not going to be friends anymore because they're going to go off to do different things. They're going to join different clubs. They're going to be in different cliques and they're going to spread apart. So they want to, you know, keep their friendship intact by doing all of these things while they're still in middle school. That's a cool concept. I really like it. I think it's really uh, interesting, but it just wasn't really executed well. Beyond the fact that it wasn't executed well, the other thing that really hurts it is that it only has one season. There's not much time to get to know these characters or get to see them grow and learn because there's only one season. So I just think that's a, it's a C tier show. It's not bad, so it's not D tier, but it's weak. It's really weak and it could have been a lot better. Up next is All That, and this is an interesting one because All That isn't really a sitcom. It's a sketch show. It's like a parody of sketch shows. I don't think it should really be on this list because it's not the sitcom genre, but I'll rate it anyways just because it's here. I was never really a fan of all that. I didn't really like it. I didn't find it funny. I didn't really like any of the sketches or anything, but it's not a bad show. It's just not my taste. So I'll just put it in a, uh, I'll put it in middle of C tier for now. As the bell rings, uh, this is another tough one to judge because it's only a series of five or 10 minute segments. Like, they're really short, they're really small, and they can't compare to these full-length episodes. So I don't think it's really fair to judge it against these. It's not bad by itself, it's okay, it's pretty enjoyable. But it's just, it doesn't stand out when you're comparing it to full-length episodes. So I'll just put it at the bottom of C tier. Austin and Ellie, uh, this is another one similar to Liv and Maddie that I didn't like at first because I thought it was too cool for teen sitcoms. But as I started watching it and as I started seeing more of it, it was really good. I liked the characters. The series finale is a real tearjerker. Like, if you follow the series and you follow the story of these friends and everything they've been through, that finale is really sad. Like, it really just tugs at your heart and really just makes you feel for these people because you've gotten to know them so much and you've gotten to care for them so much. And I think because it manages to do that and it manages to do it so well, I think it really has to be A tier. Okay, next is Bunked. Uh, Bunked is a tale of missed opportunities. Bunked could have been a good series because it's a spinoff of Jesse. So we already have established characters. We already have characters that we know, characters that we like. And you mix in new characters to bounce off of those old characters to make interesting new dynamics. It's a good idea. It could work, 
but it wasn't really executed too well in my opinion. I think Bunked really doesn't utilize the Jesse characters as well as it could have, because it doesn't really make them grow or change, they're kind of stagnant. They got their development in Jesse, now they're here in Bunked, and they're kind of just there. They don't change or grow too much anymore. They still have some moments of growth and some moments of development, but it's rare and really far in between. And then what makes it even worse is um, the later seasons of Bunked, seasons 3 and 4 I think it is, they start getting rid of cast members. And so by the latest season, nobody from Jesse's on this show anymore. So you don't have that tie to Jesse, you just have to rely on the newer characters. And the newer characters aren't bad, they're okay characters, they're fine enough. But they just don't really stand out by themselves. Without the original Jesse characters for them to work with, without that dynamic, by themselves they're just not as interesting, not as entertaining. So I think this is just a big missed opportunity for what could have been a good show, and I'll put it in C tier. I've never seen that 70s show, and I've heard mixed things about it, but I don't think I'm really going to watch that anytime soon. Uh, next is Jesse, and as I said with Bunked, Jesse has good character development, good growth. I think that the, the kids in Jesse are really good characters because they grow a lot. Like in the first season or two, I really didn't like Jesse because the characters were kind of stereotypical. They were archetypes, they didn't really have any personality traits of their own beyond this is my stereotype. But as the show grew and as the characters grew, they really broke out of those stereotypes and became their own individual characters. They kind of fleshed out, they grew a lot, I commend it a lot for that. I think Jesse has its weak points, but it also has its strong points. It's a good show, but it's not all good, so I think I'll just put it in B tier. I've never seen Clarissa Explains It All, or maybe I have and I don't remember it, but I don't know anything about it. Bizardvark is another show that I wanted to like. I really wanted to like this show, but it just wasn't as good as it could have been. I think Bizardvark is similar to Gamer's Guide to Everything, where it's just uh, companies are just cashing in on what's popular right now. What's big right now? YouTube. YouTube is big right now. Everyone loves YouTubers. YouTubers are the next big star. So let's make a show about these kids that are YouTubers. And they even have their own um, variety of categories. They have the comedy YouTubers, the beauty YouTuber, the dare YouTuber, which in this case they're Vuglers, that's what they're called in this show, but they're basically YouTubers. And so while it's not bad, it is weak. Like I like the two main characters, Paige and Frankie, the two main girls, I like them, they're likable characters. But all of the other characters are really just not, they're not good in my opinion. I don't really like them, I don't really care for them, I don't have too much to say about them. They actually got rid of uh, one of the main characters, because he was uh, played by Jake Paul or Logan Paul. I don't know which one, I don't really care which one. But Disney cut ties with him after he became really unpopular and infamous, even though he said it was his decision to leave, but I don't care about that because I don't care about him. And after he left, the show just went even more downhill because, hey, we had to completely get rid of him, so let's bring in a new cast and bring in all this new stuff. And they changed up the show so much, and it just really lost what it was supposed to be. Like, it was already a pretty weak show to begin with, it already wasn't living up to its potential, but once they got rid of him and they added in all these new characters and changed everything up, it just really was a mess. It was a huge mess. And I think this show could have been good, but I think there was just a lot of things that brought it down. So I'm going to put it in C tier. Crash and Bernstein is a show that I hate and that I have no idea why it was greenlit. I don't see anything funny about this show, I don't see the appeal of it, and I don't see why people thought it was a good idea. I'm just, I don't know. I, I don't get it at all. Henry Danger is a wonderful show. I really like this show. I think uh, Henry Danger is uh, one of the best uh, superhero sitcoms, because there's a lot of superhero sitcoms on this list. Superhero sitcoms uh, sort of became the next big thing thanks to the Marvel movies. When the Marvel movies became big and they exploded and everyone loved superheroes, the sitcom genre, the teen sitcom genre, made a lot of superhero sitcoms. Like, we already have up here Lab Rats, and there's a lot more that we'll get to, but of all of them, I think Henry Danger does it the best. It puts a lot of heart into being a superhero. Like, uh, Captain Man and Kid Danger, they're really good characters, I really like them. And we really get to see them as both heroes and as people. The show doesn't exclusively focus on them as superheroes, and it doesn't exclusively focus on them as civilians. It has a good balance, a good blend. If there's one thing I did, I wish the show did better, it's focusing more on Henry. Because the thing is, Henry Danger's been running for a long time. It's been going on for five years now. When it started, Henry was about 13. He's almost 18 now. So you know, he's almost out of high school, he's almost going on to college, he's almost going to be an adult. But the show never really addresses that. 
Like, it never really focuses on the fact that, hey, this guy who became a teenage sidekick when he was 13 has been a superhero for five years and he's almost going to be an adult and he doesn't know what he's going to do with his life. Like, they never really focus on the fact that, oh, man, it's been so long. Henry's aged so much. Like, Henry has really good development. And also, uh, Captain Man, uh, Ray Manchester, he has great development, too. Like, the two of them have a great bond, great chemistry, great dynamic. But there's not too much focus on the whole fact that Henry's gonna be an adult now. Because the whole reason that Captain Man wanted a sidekick was because he realized he can't be a superhero forever. There's gonna be a point where he's no longer able to be a hero and he needs someone to take his place. That's why he got a sidekick. And now Henry is going to be an adult of his own, which means maybe it's time for him to be a hero. Is he gonna leave the sidekick job? What's gonna happen? I really hope that these details get addressed in the series finale, which could come maybe this season, maybe next, who knows? But I really hope that they touch on that, and if they do, that'll make it an S-tier show for sure. But for now, I just gotta put it in A tier. Just because it's missing a few points that could make it so much better. Also, a uh, fun fact real quick, I actually met the cast of Henry Danger last year at a convention. I was at a panel with them, but my friend dragged me out of it halfway through, because he said it would be weird to be at a panel with a bunch of teenagers, but I said this is a good show, but he didn't listen to me. But that's a completely different story. It was pretty cool getting to meet them. I didn't talk to them too much, because I didn't really know too much about Henry Danger back then. I only got into it like very recently after having met them, I decided to take the show out. But anyways, that was fun and I'm really glad for it because I got to watch this show and this show's really good. Okay, the next show to tackle is Andy Mack. And this is the show that everyone's always talking about. You know, the show that makes all the headlines on Twitter and has all the news articles. Disney show tackles teen parenting. Disney show featuring a gay character, LGBT representation, the show that has all the headlines. And I gotta say, that's a good thing. I'm not gonna criticize it for that because it's a good thing that there's a show that's appealed, that's targeted towards uh, towards these younger people, towards kids and teenagers that's talking about these things. A show that, uh, you know, uh, exposes them to the reality of teen pregnancy, that exposes them to uh, LGBT representation. It's a good thing that these things exist. It's good that there's a show that offers this. But at the same time, I don't think a show can be carried by this. No matter how good your ideas are, you have to carry them as well. You can have all the representation you want, you can have all of the reality you want, all of the truth that you want, but if your show isn't good, then it's not going to be carried just because it does these things. So as for looking at Andy Mack as a show, how does it stand up by itself? I'd say it stands up pretty well. It's an enjoyable show. I don't really consider it too much of a sitcom, it's more of a drama, but it does have its moments of comedy. It's a good show, it holds up rather well, along with all of the huge articles always making news. It's a strong show. It's very, very serialized. So if you miss an episode, you are probably going to be lost. But they do have a recap every now and then, so that's helpful. I think if I have one complaint about this show, it's that the main character of Andy is a little selfish. I don't know if it's intended to be that way, but that's kind of how she comes off to me. Cause like at one point, uh, her mom and her dad are going to get married and she makes it a big deal of them getting married, but she doesn't really make it a deal about them getting married for their happiness. It's kind of focused on her happiness and how she's going to have her parents back and how they're going to be a family. Like she does care about their family. She's not entirely selfish, but she also focuses a lot on herself or a lot of times she wants her friends or her crush to drop whatever they're doing to help her out. And it's always focused on her. And I get that she's the main character, but it just kind of makes her seem just a little selfish. And she is a teenager. She will grow and maybe grow out of this. Maybe a bit of realism that she has been selfish. But for now, the show hasn't really addressed her selfishness. It doesn't treat it like an issue. And that kind of just brings it down a bit, in my opinion. It's still a really solid show. It still really holds up. And I'm glad that there's a show that's tackling all of these topics and exposing them to people at a young age. So I'm going to give it an A tier. Dog with a blog is next, and I think this show gets a really bad reputation just because of the uh, just because of the title. The title and the premise, the synopsis, they're pretty bad. Just judging it based off of that, it's a show about a talking dog who has a blog and wacky things ensue. It's like that sounds so ridiculous and so bad. But if you actually watch the show, the blog itself isn't a focus. It's a framing device. It's how episodes are set up, but that's it. Nothing more. 
The show itself is pretty enjoyable, pretty good. The characters are enjoyable, the dog himself is likable, the family aspect is really strong, and there's a lot going for it. It has good humor, some pretty good lessons, some good morals. And it's just really enjoyable. The characters, I don't think there's a character that I can really say I dislike. They're all likable in some sense, in some way. I think the show would have been better if they had marketed it just slightly differently. Maybe focus more on the family aspect and less on the we have a talking dog and he has a blog and wackiness. Because it's not really a wacky show. It's not too over the top with its silliness. It's pretty grounded in reality and that's saying something for a show with a talking dog. So I think if it had been marketed differently, maybe it could have been more popular. But I like it. I think it's good. So I'm going to give it B tier. Pair of Kings is another show that I have mixed feelings about just because it started off really good, really strong, and I really enjoyed it. And then season three happened because uh, during I don't know if it was during production or in between, most likely in between because production would have messed things up. But anyways, at some point, uh, Mitchell Musso got arrested for a DUI and Disney cut ties with him. And rather than canceling the show, they decided to replace him and bring in another actor to make a brand new character. And it just really derailed the story a lot. It ruined a lot of character development. It ruined a lot of growth. It completely just, they threw away a lot of plot lines. Like they just threw away a lot of lore. It just brought down the show so much. Like I feel the better alternative would have been just canceling it and ending at season two. Cause season two's finale wasn't a perfect finale but it was a satisfying one. It brought closure to a lot of uh, ongoing plots. It brought some nice character development. It had some good character moments and it would have been much better ending it there than giving us the third season that just really brought the show down so much. Cause season three introduced, oh, it's not, they're not twins, they're triplets, but their uh, third brother was thought dead cause he was lost at sea and he was raised on an island with monkeys and he became king of that island. And I don't even know what happened. It was just so ridiculous. And aside from that, they, like I said, they threw away so many plot lines and so much character development for this brand new character that nobody liked. And it was just a huge mess that just really shouldn't have happened. It's not, it's not Pair of King's fault that all of this stuff went down, but I still have to say that season three brought it down so much. I'm going to give it B tier just because the first two seasons were really strong and really good. If season three hadn't happened, it would be A tier. But with season three, I just got to give it B tier. Sydney to the Max is another brand new show on uh, on Disney Channel. It's really new. I think it only has like eight or nine episodes. But anyways, it's really new, really uh, brand new. And it's a show that I love a lot. Like I really enjoy this show just because I love its unique framing device. The framing device for this show is essentially that uh, the teenage girl Sydney is going through her teenage life. I think she's in middle school, but I'm not sure. But the point is she's going through her teenage life and she gets into, into these circumstances and situations and then it's revealed that everything she's going through, her dad went through at her age. And I just love this framing device because we get to see the dad's perspective when he was her age, when he was growing up. And I love that because it shows, even though there's a generational gap, even though there's been advancements in technology and even though society has grown and all of these changes have happened, the things that people are going through are still relatively the same. Like it's still the same situations, just different circumstances and different resolutions. But at the end of the day, we're not that different from those who came before us. And we won't be too different from those who come after us. People are people no matter the time period. Things change such as technology, views in society, people are growing all the time. But people aren't as different as we would like to think. There's the idea that as technology advances or as society grows, that people become radically different. But they aren't really as different as we would imagine. And this show does a wonderful job of portraying that. Beyond that, I just absolutely love the, uh, the father and daughter dynamic. Their relationship is really good. It's authentic. I really like the relationship that they hold. So this is the show just does a lot of good things. I would put it in S tier, but I think it's too new. It only has about 10 episodes, like I said. And I don't really feel comfortable putting a show that new in S tier. So for now, I'll just put it uh, near the uh, top of A tier. Unfabulous, I also don't know that. And I don't really... I feel like I watched it, but I don't remember it. And I don't really feel like I'm missing out on too much. Uh, Good Luck Charlie. This is another show that I really love for its framing device. The framing device of this show is... Uh, 
uh, older sister is making uh, video messages to her younger sister Charlie so that she can have some advice when she's a teenager and she's going through these same things. It's kind of similar to uh, Sydney to the Max where it shows that, you know, people aren't that different. I mean, in this case, it's less of a generational gap because they're siblings rather than father and daughter, but it still shows that even though there's an age gap, people are going to go through the same things and people are going to be prepared to pass on the lessons that they've learned. It's a really good show, and furthermore, this is a great character-driven show. I love the characters in this show, I love the family, they get along so well, they have a great relationship, a great dynamic. The situations and circumstances they get into are pretty realistic, it's pretty uh, enjoyable, there's good things to learn from it, and I think it's just a really strong show, I think it holds up so well. So I'm gonna put that in A tier. Drake and Josh is next, and man, I love Drake and Josh. Drake and Josh is like uh, one of the top shows. That one's going in S tier for sure. Drake and Josh does so much well, and it does so much right. Like, I, I love the relationship that Drake and Josh have with each other. Their dynamic is so good. It's like, it's the epitome of the uh, the straight man and the funny guy. Like, they just bounce off of each other so well. Like, one does one thing, and then the other blows up and yells at him. And then the other thing that I really love is that they're changing roles. You know, sometimes, sometimes Drake will be the guy who's trying to solve things and figure things out, and Josh is the one who's, like, going crazy. And other times, Drake will be like, oh, my, what are we gonna do? And Josh is gonna be like, hey, dude, calm down. Like, they change things up, and they inner, like... They change roles, and that's really good. They don't have, like, an established role. You're always the serious one. You're always the funny one. Like, it, based on the circumstances, they mix things up. And then you add in their younger sister, Megan, and she, her pranks, and she's just hilarious. It's a blast. It's a great show. I really love it. I think I think this is one of the best sitcoms out there, just because the characters are all so good. The humor is top-notch. I don't think there is anything that can beat Drake and Josh. The Fresh Prince of Bel-Air, that's another uh, classic show, another iconic one. I think everyone loves this show. Uh, Will Smith, he's a huge guy. Everyone loves him. You should totally go see him as uh, the genie in Aladdin this weekend, or next weekend, or on DVD and Blu-ray if that's out by the time you're watching this. But anyways, the point is, Will Smith is a he's a great guy. He's, he's awesome. This show is really good. I actually did not like this show at first, but that's because I think I was too young to really appreciate it. I think as I got older and a bit more mature, I really saw there was a lot to this show that just really makes it stand out and really good. It's an icon, and I don't think I can give it anything less than S tier. Game Shakers, on the other hand, I don't really like this show. That one's going into D tier. There's not too much to say about Game Shakers, but I just really dislike it. I dislike all of the main characters. They're all pretty annoying and not fun to watch. I don't find the humor in this show good. Like, the characters are all jerks. I, they're all really rude to each other. They don't have good chemistry with each other. They all come off as just unlikable. There's nothing about this show that's really redeeming about it. I don't, I don't enjoy watching it. I don't enjoy sitting through an episode. And I don't like any of the characters in this show. There's nothing here for me. And I don't think it's well made. I just don't think this was a good show. And I really wish it had been better because it has some, it has a few interesting ideas. The premise is just okay, you know, a, a team of kids making their own gaming apps. Uh, that's, it's just, an, it's an okay premise. It could have been better, but as is, there's nothing in here that I really like. Actually, I'll put it above Crash and Bernstein because even though that's unlikable, that should have never happened. Next is Big Time Rush, and this is also really a classic and iconic nostalgia. I was the type of guy who had Big Time Rush songs on his MP3, but he never played them in public because he was worried someone else would like look over and see what he was listening to and that he would be embarrassed. I don't think it's the type of thing I would listen to now. I don't think that's really my style or my genre. But back in the day when I was a kid, yeah, you could totally hear me jamming out to whatever songs they had. I don't, I don't even remember their songs. I'm sure if I find my old MP3 somewhere in this household, I could maybe load it up and see what they had going on. But anyways, their music was good. As for the show itself, the show was enjoyable. It focused much more on the characters than the music. But unlike I'm in the band, it also had a pretty good focus on the music itself. Like the episodes usually ended with their latest song or their latest album or whatever. And it had a good balance of characters and music. It balanced it very well. And I think it's just a good show. So I'm going to put it in a... I'll put it in B tier. Alright, next up is my boy Corey. And you know he's got to go into S tier. Nothing more to say about that. Okay, I'm kidding. Memes aside, I actually am going to put Corey in the house in S tier. 
not for the meme, but rather because I actually genuinely like this show, and I do think this is one of the best uh, Disney sitcoms out there. The circumstances and situations that they get in themselves into are just so over the top hilarious. The characters are all just so insanely hilarious. Like, it's one of the funniest shows out there. And the fact that it has become a meme, I think it just sort of shows the humor that's there. I think it's a great show. And I don't know. I think it doesn't get enough love. Like, I know that's crazy to say when everyone's talking about this show, but I still think it doesn't get enough recognition or love for what it actually does. People love it because it's a meme to love it, but it's actually a really solid show.